Welcome to the REI Diamonds Show with Dan Breslin, your source for real estate investment jewels of wisdom. Welcome to the REI Diamond Show. I'm your host, Dan Breslin, and this is episode 157 on leveraging legal counsel to grow your business with Denise Gearock. Denise is a Chicago business attorney with a background in commercial real estate development and also buying and selling companies. The reason I've invited Denise on the show today is to brainstorm the strategy for a real estate business owner to prepare for an exit, grow through acquisitions, or simply just exit this current corona COVID pandemic safely, at least in terms of the business. As I'm currently in the market for new business acquisitions myself as part of the Diamond Equity Investments Growth Strategy, this episode was created as a bit of a tool for myself, a fact-finding mission to gain more knowledge on deal-making when it comes to business. Actually, come to think of it, I guess all the REI Diamond Show episodes would actually fit into that description. Anyway, let's get to it. All right. Welcome to the REI Diamond Show. Denise, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, and I'm really happy to be part of your show. It's really an interesting uh, way for people to learn about uh, real estate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not just my show. I, I, I'm amazed at how much great information I get from a variety of podcasts and a variety of topics across the board. That like That wasn't here when I got started in 2006, so I think people are uh, blessed, even if they don't know it, to be here in 2020 with these kind of tools that are readily available and for free. But enough about that. Denise, for people who do not know who you are, do you want to give kind of a little bit of the backstory and what your business looks like today? Um, sure. Um, you know, I started out actually as a CPA, um, and I thought uh, I became that because I said, well, maybe that'll help pay my way through law school. So then I went through law school, and I uh, worked as an attorney for a while. And uh, then in 2006, um, I uh, decided, because uh, an opportunity came to me, that I would uh, be a commercial real estate developer while I was practicing law as well. And uh, that was an interesting time, uh, you know, uh, because in 2008, uh, you know what happened from 2008 till probably 2012, 13. Um, you know, it had a lot of life lessons uh, that I got out of that that uh, I use even today in, uh, you know, counseling my, my real estate uh, clients. Um, and then I'm, I've been an attorney all the way through, um, and... Uh, uh, you know, every time I've had one of these uh, rocky moments, like, uh, you know, the commercial real estate that I was in, um, you know, I sit down and I kind of make a list of the lessons that I learned out of that, um, because each one of those is, like uh, on your show, it's that jewel. It's that jewel of wisdom that you're able to uh, incorporate into your repertoire going forward. Um, and so that's what I tend to do. Um, my end of the real estate business was commercial, as I said. We were developing office condos, and we had about a $35 million project uh, going, um, of course, before the crash. So um, it, it's all good, and, uh, you know, I'm in one of the buildings even today. So um, And so from there, I kind of uh, moved uh, my practice more over to Looking at uh, the vision of um, a business, um, you know, owner, and uh, looking at uh, where they wanted to take this business, what kinds of things do they see consistently happening that takes their eyes off of the ball of, of growth, how I can assist them in growing, and uh, training them as to how best to use an attorney. They're, you know, actually an investment, not a cost. Um, and then where do they want to be uh, and when do they want to get out? Or maybe they don't. I see a lot of people that don't. So, you know, that is the focus of my practice today. But, you know, it wouldn't have gotten to that point without uh, my having gone through all of those life cycles that I have uh, over the years. Yeah, and that's really interesting to hear you say that. So even some of the attorneys that I have, uh, I don't know how many now. It's It's a lot. 
a lot of people for our company that's in Atlanta. Uh, we're in Atlanta, we're in Philadelphia, we're in Chicago, and there's different uh, attorneys we call on for a variety of different reasons in each of those markets. So I'm not sure what our roster is currently looking like, but we invest in a lot of legal work throughout the course of every year. And in the beginning, Denise, I did not, I didn't even know to ask about experience or had they been through the situation or did they even specialize? I didn't realize certain attorneys specialize in this and others, you know, in a different thing. So I didn't even know how to shop for legal services when I was starting my business back in 2006. Sure. And I, I probably, I probably didn't start to figure that out only until a few years ago, maybe, you know, 2016, 17. Oh, wow. Look, there's certain experiences and, uh, ha has my attorney been through this type of negotiation if I'm in a lawsuit defending myself to be capable of, uh, you know, negotiating a settlement? That's negotiating. That's not just let's march to court and do a settlement because if the other attorney is a better negotiator, I'm in trouble. Um, it so, can happen so it's that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's refreshing to hear your experience because there's a lot of, a lot of stakes. I mean, would you mind diving into a bit of the details of a $35 million project? I mean, it seems like a pretty big number. It's probably, uh, a lot of stress. I, I mean, how, how did you end up making the decision to go into that deal in the first place? And what was your role in that? Um, so I imagine there was a team working there. What was your role in that project? Um, well, I, it started out uh, because uh, I was renting along with a, another person, a different business, uh, you know, some property and uh, they weren't they weren't maintaining the uh, the building very well, and so we talked to each other at the time and said, "Well, well, we couldn't do any worse. Why don't we make an offer for that building?" And uh, luckily, um, you know, they had another building that they wanted to sell both of them, and we didn't want both, so that deal didn't happen. But then someone uh, said, "Oh, down the street, uh, you know, one of the uh, bigger companies was uh, selling a." a probably an 18 acre site and uh you know there's a building already on it and we could retrofit that and along with uh another 13 buildings uh that would be put up on the site um and then sell them at uh, for office condos um and the the trick was that everybody that bought was generally going to borrow from uh their home equity line uh on their house and then they would fix their payments uh, for rent going forward and uh, be able to, um, you know, master their, their future destiny. And that went well for a while until they had no equity in their house. <laughs> and so that model, uh, you know, kind of didn't work after about 28, 29, 2009. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, my role in that was to uh, basically uh, lead. I had a team. Uh, I had a a sales uh, person from a major firm. I had uh, an architect, an engineer, uh, you know, I had a general contractor. Um, and so, you know, everything that needed to be done uh, as a developer, um, you know, we had to do. Uh, finding, helping to find people, bird dog people that uh, might want to uh, buy an office condo, uh, handling and negotiating the agreements, um, and doing all of the closings for each and every one, um, structuring all of the um, the buildings uh, so that uh, each one that came online, we had to approve the plans and take them to uh, uh, the planning commission and uh, in the city uh, uh, departments, and uh, you know get them all online and ready to sell. So, um, in hindsight, I would say that um, it always takes a lot longer than you ever think. And um, it also always costs more than you ever think as well. <laughs> so just part of uh, the lessons. Um, and also, uh, when you're in commercial particularly, uh, there is a, a pretty significant uh, cycle in real estate uh, that is uh, just a general cycle. You know, when it's up, uh, you, you uh, make hay when the sun is shining, but when it's not, um, you know, then uh, it's going to be dead for a while. Um, I think in most uh, people that are, are doing or did uh, commercial real estate had no idea that the cycle would be as deep uh, as it was after 2008. Um, 
you know, because a lot of those developers basically uh, aren't developers anymore. Uh, they were kind of cashed out at that point. So, um, you know, a lot of, uh, as I say, a lot of lessons uh, that were learned out of that. And, um, you know, it's uh, you have to watch uh, the time that you go into this thing to make sure you're at the right cycle. Um, you're always going to need more cash than what you thought, so make sure you have uh, enough cash flow. Um, your city is generally going to be the one who is um, extending uh, the time frame for you getting your product out there to sell uh, because there's always something that they want, something more, uh, and uh, so it takes longer, and that interferes with the business cycle, the natural business cycle of selling the commercial developer development. So um, it's, uh, yeah, it was a very interesting uh, thing to go through. And um, it's been really helpful because I do a lot of uh, commercial work uh, for my my real estate clients uh, even now. Yeah, I'd imagine that something like this, uh, all of what you just said, I'm vaguely familiar, but haven't walked through a lot of myself. Uh, I would imagine this is, you know, powerful experience for developer clients who would know their attorney has actually done this kind of stuff versus just like real estate representation. And one of the things you said, Denise, that I think I've heard before from other people who developed, and I know some people who had, let's say, successful development careers through certain periods. I I personally don't know many who have gone, you know, 40 or 50 years. Uh, You know, maybe like a a friend of mine was a builder in the in the 80s. So through the 80s, then by the time 1989 came, that's it. He was done and he was never willing to take the risk again after that. Uh, I have some friends who are building right now. Uh, We'll see if they still continue. I have some friends who are building through actually the 2009, 10, 11, like through that very depth of the market. They were building student housing and selling to people in New York City. So it was a very niche product. Right. The cycle came back online in in a way where it's almost, from my view, which is not as a developer, I buy and sell single family houses, but I learn I'm learning the lesson right now in real money that it's almost like a timing of the market. If I'm going to be even flipping houses, you know, little two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar houses that we flip, uh, or if I'm building a a one or a ten or a fifteen million or even hundred million dollar project. My ability to time the market almost like you would time the stock market in things like, you know, the interest rates and there's yeah a lot of luck that comes into play or the business cycle itself, a lot of luck that comes into play there. The inflation of product over the past two to three years has been a little bit of a killer for my own business and for some of the other developers I know because they, they bought projects that were going to take two or three years, but the material costs went way up and the labor costs went way up. And so there's a very troubling storm on the horizon, obviously, right now in April 2020 with COVID hanging out there. But I'm amazed as I've had a little more time to reflect on the development business. It's not fixed. The way we look at a house, you know, it's it's like a fix. We hope we can sell it for 200,000. We build our numbers on that. We usually end up right around that 200. But the developers I know who made a lot of money build it on 200, the market went up to 220, 240 per house, and they had, you know, 60 of them in the pipeline, so they made, like, a lot of money. But when the cycle turns and the 200 turns into, you know, 180, there's no way, like, the market just moves against them. So, yeah, there's some cost efficiency, and there's being good with subs and having great resources and team, but, man, a lot of the things are outside of the control where Dan Breslin, me, I'm just going to take – I'm going to take a sideline view on real estate development. That was initially, you know, for me, it was when I got into business. Well, I'm going to be a real estate developer. I'm going to build skyscrapers. And you know what? Mm-hmm. I, I don't think I ever want to take on that level of <laughs> risk because I'm, I'm, I've seen the cycle kind of guy. I don't, I don't understand the cycle deep enough. And my crystal ball got lost recently when the COVID thing started <laughs> uh, yeah. for me to, you know, hold the harbor that dream any longer. Well, I think uh, the the thing to watch for is if you have a ton of development going on, and like in Chicago uh, area, there's a ton of uh, apartments uh, that are going up uh, throughout the downtown area, and you keep seeing that, then it's time to get out of that market and go and do something else, um, because 
um, eventually the market is going to be saturated and there's not going to be enough uh, a demand for your product when you get it online. So you're going to be the one taking the hit because they're, they already got there ahead of you. So that's one way to kind of hopefully time the market. And I think that probably works in single family homes to some extent as well. Um, although that, that may be somewhat, uh, you know, fear based in the case of COVID, uh, cause that slows everything down. Or it may be, uh, because of interest rates or where they are. Uh, and, um, you know, the general economy where, where that is. So those are your kind of things I would think, uh, you know, would help you to time the market in residential real estate. Yeah. A few years back, we bought some, uh, we, we have these little sleeper neighborhoods and I did a show and it's like neighborhoods that the investors didn't really look at. So as better school districts and, you know, uh, less lower supply markets kind of got all bought up after we came out of 2009, 10, 11, et cetera. Uh, these sleeper markets were typically the kind of areas like that no one paid attention to them because the values were kind of like low and the crime was a little bit higher. And those right. little like tertiary markets inside of the city of Chicago and Atlanta, and there's, there's a few of them, or they're all around yeah. the country. But, mm-hmm. but they're like the lower end of the price point. So they went from, you know, $100,000 after a renovation. Some of them went up to 150, 170, 185. Well, now there's room to actually do the renovation and make a profit. So if a flipper was out here flipping in and preferred like the lower supply neighborhoods, you know, they had to go into these other areas in order to find product to keep busy and keep their machine running where we bought a few of those and we bought them on the old numbers and then the market, you know, saved our butt. We, we took too long mm-hmm. to do the renovation. Uh, we spent more money than we thought we were going to, and it was going to be a lose a money losing deal, but the market saved us. And then we have a couple of them that are still hanging out there where the, the market didn't have room to keep going up and save us, but yet we spent more money and we, so we make the mistakes too. And obviously we make, you know, a lot of other deals where they actually make, make money and, and it works. Um, but we'll we'll see what happens right now with COVID going on. And even with uh, the shutdown and the lockdown in three different markets where we're located, we're actually seeing the buyers have a preference for vacant and renovated properties and then also new construction. Now, I don't do new uh, construction, so that's secondhand. Mm-hmm. But if we have renovated houses that, you know, it's clean, it's sanitized, no one's been coughing and sneezing in there as far as people. And that may or may not be the truth. There could have been an agent there earlier that afternoon with, with, with the virus coughing for all anyone knows. But the perception is, oh, it's not lived in. This is clean. This is sanitized compared to trying to do showings that are occupied. So renovated and right. vacant product is kind of the hot ticket as we speak right now. Right. We'll have to see how that uh, flows over the balance of 2020. Yeah, I agree. So let's uh, switch gears here a little bit, Denise, Mm -hmm. and let's start talking about some of the business stuff. So like, you know, you operate as kind of the outsourced general counsel for a business owner, and I'm going to go out on the limb and I'm going to assume that, you know, we're talking about businesses that, uh, I don't know, they're in in startup or they're they're family owned. Like, I, I don't think we're, for the sake of our show, talking about businesses with a uh, hundred plus employees, maybe we're talking about, you know, what, five to 10 employees, maybe, maybe 20. Is that like safe assumption to kind of? Um, it varies uh, depending on the type of business it is. So some of ours are manufacturing, some of them are service, some of them are uh, real estate. Um, but the thing uh, about this is, is you're, you're getting a, a an attorney that uh, you feel very comfortable with that's kind of partnering with you that's going to uh, be able to recognize when you have problems so for purposes of your viewers I had uh, one um, company that uh, had hired us as an outsourced general counsel kind of a fractional you know general counsel and uh, you know he had hmm, 24 different uh, companies And so I said, okay, draw me a picture of how these companies interrelate with each other. So he did. Then I said, okay, give me all your Secretary of State reports. Let's see what, uh, you know, they have to say about this. I'll draw that picture. So now I had two different pictures. And then I asked him to give me all of his uh, tax returns uh, for each and every one of these. 
And um, I had three different pictures that didn't relate to each other. And I found two companies had never reported uh, anything or filed a tax return. So um, it's that kind of attention to detail that um, if you have the right person uh, as a fractional general counsel, uh, that they can uh, look at those things, make sure you're okay. So what's most important in your business? It's, you know, taking your the ball down the field and growing your business. Um, every time that you end up getting a notice from uh, IRS or from Illinois, well, in our case, Illinois Department of Revenue, in your case, the state of Georgia, uh, whatever, um, it takes your eyes off of the ball. So while most people want to look at, uh, you know, hiring an attorney as, oh, my, this is a cost, it's really the investment in your future. And most people don't understand that. Uh, you, you know, I have to enlighten them about it because it, it's really, um, you know, good for them. And it's, it's a, a fun process to build a team that has your back. Um, rather than uh, just hiring a hired gun here and there when you're desperate and you need somebody. How much can they know about your business? How much can they know that everything is organized and you're not going to be hit with something? So that's, that's the, uh, you know, theory behind why you would hire an outsourced general counsel and why it's really important. Um, because if there's one thing that I've learned over the years, you have to be all about growth. Even in uh, times of a recession, like they say we're in now, we're in a V recession or something. Um, you know, <laughs> we, that, that's a time for opportunity because there's a lot of people that get scared or they run out of money and they have to sell, they want to get out. And that's a time for opportunity um, if you play your cards right. So that requires that you're going to start doing a little bit more planning then a lot of real estate uh, people are more seat of the pants kind of thing, and they just kind of go with the flow. Um, but if you plan and if you make sure that you've got all your I's dotted and your T's crossed, um, you can be successful during a recession. So, you know, that, yeah, that, that is why I think it's really important. That's a great point, Denise. I mean, as we speak right now, we are in – certainly the most uncertain time for a lot of people who are listening to this as we speak. And it's uh, the question on a lot of people's mind right now is it's, it's like, Oh, do I, do I buy for the real estate community? Do I buy, you know, this property and then plan on flipping this property? Do I buy this property and plan on holding it as a rental? And some of the properties available right now have tenants. And here we are in, in Chicago and, and other areas of the country and, we have tenants who are basically saying, oh, the government said I don't have to pay my rent and you can't evict me, so I'm not paying. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's definitely uncertain and, and it carries over into a lot of the other businesses are facing similar challenges. And I remember just, you know, in 2009, and I don't know if you could relate to it, in 2010, I, I felt like I allowed the fear and the crisis to occupy my entire mind. I read all the articles. I paid attention to all the headlines and I did nothing but consume and manifest and recreate. It seemed like the crisis in my own personal habits in life. And I remember when, when I finally worked my way out of that, you know, starting in 2012 to the, you know, place where we're at, my company is, is blessed to be. We did like $5 million plus last year in profit. So we had like a, our best year ever. And to get to that point took me to work and sell and make deals and produce to get out of that mire. And through that process, the life lesson that I that I learned that I applied recently again was I am not going to pay attention to and allow the you know economic crisis, the panic, whatever it is, to consume me and turn into physical results in my life of you know destruction, bankruptcy, uh, whatever. I mean. God, God forbid, God willing, n no virus and, and everyone remains safe, all those things considered. Early on when this COVID started to unfold for me, it was like, I'm, I'm looking at the numbers. I'm trying to make sense of it. I'm trying to rationalize this and stock markets down. And I made an intentional decision that if really important information was out here floating around, it would make its way filtered to me and through me, through people on my team, to people that I was talking to or an occasional glance at a headline, I didn't need to pay constant attention to what was happening. 
And as soon as I did that, Denise, as soon as I remembered that my way was to sell, was to make deals, was to produce, was to work on the business, get back to my vision and get back into growth mode, regardless of what was going on, it was like a light bulb switch and the light was back on. And our company wasn't in danger. We had a really good resources and assets built up. And so we weren't like in danger of going bankrupt. I'm sure there's other people who are in much more precarious situations than our company uh, is or was, you know, a few weeks ago. But I just re realized the strength in that mental flipping of the switch and deciding not to pay attention to certain things and to reapply my attention to the places where I'd gotten the results in the past. And it's been very mentally freeing um you know allowed just the storm in my mind to kind of calm down and and like my level of execution in the business to get back to where it was you know all along until that covid thing kind of struck right and you know if you look back as another example uh, to 2008 um you know banks didn't really know what they were doing with all of their failed properties that were in their portfolios but eventually they hired uh people to sell uh these portfolios and taking their loss. So someone else's loss is really your gain. Um you know, I hate to say it that way, but uh you know, that is an opportunity uh for you to finish a project, for you to make money off of it. But you can't do it if you're mentally um involved and immersed into you know, woe is me and uh, we're in this recession, we'll never get out or anything like that. So you have to kind of erase those kind of thoughts from your mind and really focus on growth uh, and know that um, in your yourself that, um, you know, a recession is a time to make money um, and you can do it. So um, once you're in that mode, it is very freeing to know that, um, you know, you're safe. And, and you're going to move the ball down the field. And no matter what happens with other people, you know that money is being made. Um, you know, you know, you may not know like people that are your, uh, direct friends that are making a, a lot of money, but there are other, uh, people involved in real estate that are making money right now. And so if you're not, why aren't you? Change the attitude, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So is there anyone, you know, but recently since it's on, on everyone's mind from, from your position as the business counsel, are, are there any kind of issues where you've, you know, had the opportunity in the last couple of weeks to, I don't know, talk anyone off the ledge, get them refocused, you know, reevaluate the growth strategy in their business, in, in your business that, that might have kind of given you some recent life lessons, Denise? Um, well, I've uh, spoken with a lot of uh, my business clients uh, over the last number of weeks, and uh, most of the time, you know, they, up until just recently, they've been living in fear like everyone else because they don't know what to expect. And I do end up, uh, you know, talking them off of the ledge, and, uh, you know, they generally appreciate that because as a business owner, who do you talk to? You Go home, you talk to your girlfriend, your wife, um, who doesn't really get the stress and the strain that you're under as a business owner, um, especially if you have payroll to cover or um, you have things to cover uh, through loans and, and what have you. Um, but, you know, if you talk to somebody that really gets it, um, you know, then it's easier to uh, come off of that ledge and, and look at things in a different fashion. So I think having somebody that um, is either um, in your same business or an attorney that uh, has been part of your team that understands and has been there, um, has, um, you know, gone through the bad times in the real estate uh, market, um, is important to keep you focused on what your main goals are. Um, so, yes, over this time, I, I would say a lot of people are doing a lot more things remotely. Um, they are pivoting their businesses in different fashions. Uh, um, if they're in real estate, uh, you know, they're uh, looking at, um, you know, going more to a cash position in some respects. Um, you know, they know that they have the issues of, hey, you can't throw bad tenants out as easily, um, but it was never easy to throw them out in uh, Illinois, I'll tell you that. Um, Agreed. You know, so 
you know, it's just that they they have to know that's their their business and they're just going to conduct their business and they're going to plow through this. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, you know, having somebody that can help you, you're, it, it's a mind game. It's like they say, you know, golf is a, a game that's played between the ears. So is real estate. So is any business. Um, and if you aren't uh, in your positive uh, mode, uh, that's you're not going to attract those opportunities and you're not going to follow through and, and make the uh, success out of the business that you envision um, when you're sitting down in your quiet moments and looking at what your vision really is for your company, where are you going with it? Yeah, and that's spot on. One of the challenges, Denise, this isn't really like a COVID challenge, but uh, I know that I've questioned, you know, va- value in my own business. Like, I'm sure a lot of business owners on the small business side, especially, the business can't really function without the owner, specialized knowledge, uh, what have you. So it's like people say like, oh, what's the exit strategy? Like, I don't know that there's much of an exit strategy without, you know, me actually doing the, you know, especially other real estate flippers with obviously the real estate. If you were holding rental property, then there's value and you could determine it by looking at all of the, uh, you know, properties, values added up and selling them all off. So that's obvious. But I think like a fix and flip business, I don't know that it's really a business because without the owner's ability to select the right property and then manage the cruise, I mean, what's really left? Have you seen other businesses or even real estate businesses where that owner was such integral piece uh, initially with without the vision or without sitting down and figuring out how to like turn it into something that was valuable, but go through a process of uh, an owner dependent business trends forming itself over time, intentionally following a vision to get it to a place where it's the kind of business where the owner could exit and actually have saleable pieces there? Maybe you could give a specific yeah. example if you've ever seen such a thing. Right. I mean, this is possible to do. Um, you know, you it takes a probably about a five-year uh, period of time. So if you knew you were going to want to exit the business in five years, um, this is what you're focused on uh, building. You need uh, systems and processes. You need to have those things uh, in writing. Uh, You need to have your team built out, and you need to eventually replace yourself. And that's not to say you're not going to be in the business, but if uh, you're the one who picks out all the properties, you're going to find some uh, other person that you're going to bring into the business who can do those things. Um, If you sold the business tomorrow and you didn't have any of that, then you're just uh, selling the business and buying yourself a job working for somebody else because they're not, if they pay you something for the the business, they're not going to want to have it without you being there. So what you want to do is uh, have, give yourself enough runway before you are going to exit. And then you have to, uh, you know, build out your business so that everything that is done in that business is systematized, um, is followed by your team, and that you have the right team members in place in all respects. Um, You can, uh, with those team members, have uh, uh, contracts, um, you know, with them so that they will stay on. Once you uh, go, you can incentivize them to uh, stay on once, uh, you know, the the business is sold. So, again, uh, you don't have to be there every single day. Uh, listening to uh, somebody else tell you what to do, which is really difficult when you've owned and managed your own business before. So, yes, it is possible to do. I tell all of my clients to find a good valuation person and have your business valued. Get a rule of thumb of what your business is worth. Um, They can tell you it's uh, every uh, type of business is like X times your gross revenues or, or what have you. Um, and then they, if you have a good valuation person, they can also give you some advice as to how can you make this more valuable. Uh, what I see with a lot of uh, clients is uh, the owners always think their business is worth more than it is. Um, and that's because they haven't done the things I just uh, described. Um, you know, but it's important that they have that eye opener and then leave themselves some time to, um, you know, move into that phase where they can uh, get out. 
Now, you know, not everybody wants to get out or have an exit strategy. Maybe their exit strategy is, hey, I want to invest and start an, another business. So I don't want to be, um, you know, doing 24-7 this business. But they still have to go through the same process. Or alternatively, they may say, well, um, I think I could get a better price on this if I start buying some other different agencies or real estate, uh, you know, development uh, type companies, and I have a, a bigger footprint, and then I can make uh, some bigger dollars off of it. So uh, exit doesn't have to mean like I'm um, not going to do this anymore, and I'm going to uh, move to I don't know some some island in the Caribbean, and I'm I'm like done. <laughs> it can be a lot of things for different people. Um, when you're as busy as you are, Dan, uh, every day, it would be probably very difficult to just uh, lay on the beach all the time and, you know, not do anything. Um, I've had several clients that uh, when they've sold their business, uh, I inquire, what are you doing? Uh, what are you going to do with yourself when you sell? Uh, a couple of them have told me, you know, hey, I never get to play enough golf. And I tell them, you know, hey, in six months you're going to be so bored, you can't, uh, you know, imagine how bored you're going to be. And you're going to come back to me and say, can I buy my business back? And you won't believe it, but I've actually had two clients who did come back to me and, you know, straight up six months later uh, and asked me, is it too late to buy my business back? Because they were bored. Wow. So, you know, it's very difficult uh, for an entrepreneur uh, to totally uh, get out of being in business because they need something to occupy what's between the ears. And, um, you know, but that doesn't mean it has to be this business. It could be something totally different. So you are, by building your business out like I have described, you're giving yourself options. You have the option to sell in five years. You have the option to buy other businesses. You have the option to go into another business and let have a general manager who's going to run this one. So you want to have options. Options are what allow you the freedom, and that's why you came in as an entrepreneur. You wanted the freedom to call your own shots. So uh, that requires some planning and some thinking through, as you could tell. Makes sense. Where does a business owner go to get their finger on the pulse of other businesses that they might acquire as they're trying to compile, like you kind of mentioned with the real estate developer or buying other real estate agencies, or if I wanted to buy a mortgage company to kind of bolt on to my real estate brokerage company, where can I go to kind of like find the marketplace for these acquisitions? Is there such a thing? Well, uh, the best way is uh, through word of mouth, uh, through people that you know. So every uh, type of business has uh, vendors, suppliers, um, you know, that are out there and they are listening to people. So in the case of real estate, you might have title companies, you might have appraisers, uh, you know, you have um, uh, valuation, uh, other valuation services, surveyors, um you know, you are talking to, uh, you know, maybe the city um, on uh, what, uh, you know, this area is going to be and their master plan, and you're just going to start asking the question, you know, hey, uh, you know, we're looking to, you know, grow a little bit, and um, we wondered if you had run across any, uh, you know, real estate uh, companies that, you know, maybe they're getting closer to wanting to sell because, uh, you know, there's a a boomer with a health issue or something like that. And so do you know of any of those? And over time, you will uh, run across uh, these, and then you have to evaluate them and see if they're a good fit. Um, because what will kill a deal um, and make it not successful, if, even if you go through with it, is to not have the right culture fit. You know, you have to have everything. It's just got to flow and think. And if uh, what you're bringing in doesn't match with uh, what your systems uh, and processes and your culture is, it's not going to work well. And it's not going to be successful. So, you know, there's an art and a science to this, but that's kind of where you start. Um, you know, 
Sometimes people will find things uh, online that are for sale, but I think uh, it's it's still coming to you through someone else, a trusted advisor that you have. You could have uh, an accountant uh, for your business or your own attorney that uh, might run across some something in the course of uh, their businesses uh, where they can be helpful to you. So that's the best place, I think, to start. When you had clients, you know, one or two that has sold in the past, how did they find the buyer? Were they approached by a company? Is that kind of, you know, the courting process or what did that look like? Right. Most of the time they were. on. There are business brokers that are out there um, that are still functioning. And, uh, you know, many of those will uh, look for successful businesses uh, to court. And so you might get a call uh, from one of them, um, you know, if uh, they're looking to buy something. Um, so on the, you know, if you're looking to buy, then, you know, you can also call those business brokers. Say if you run across this, uh, you know, let me know if uh, so I know if it's a good fit. Um, you might have uh, business publications uh, in uh, the different people that listen to in your audience uh, subscribe to, uh, and they may have uh, some place in there that allows people to post uh, ads, you know, for businesses for sale. Um, So, you know, that's another, you know, potential option. So there are ways to to do it. Uh, You just have to, again, keep your eyes open for those opportunities because they're there every day. uh, But most of the time we're kind of uh, oblivious to it because we're busy and we're not focused. Gotcha. So are there any are there any book recommendations? They don't have to be real estate related just because we're a real estate crew here uh, in the REI Diamonds show audience. But Denise, do you have any, you know, one or two books that you'd recommend where, I don't know, it could help with business law, it could just be about business or just two books you've recommended most often to people? Well, I'm kind of an eclectic reader myself. So, you know, I look at all different sorts of industry. I will look at marketing, read marketing books, uh, you know, um, and uh, different, uh, even the online articles on uh, exit uh, strategies or uh, succession uh, planning. And so I don't know that I would recommend any particular one book or two books. Uh, it, it's kind of a cumulative thing where you are, um, you know, reading a lot, absorbing a lot, um, and, and being a sponge <laughs> because uh, as you go along, all of those things that you learn uh, where somebody is maybe doing a blog post and they're talking about, um, you know, what happened, what went wrong in a particular transaction, you kind of remember that and the next transaction you do that's similar, you're going to think of that. So, you know, while it's easy to, you know, just rely on a a book or two books, I think uh, life is what's teaching you. And so you need to absorb from all different sources. So I can't really recommend one, but um, keep your eyes open for opportunities to learn. Yeah, I always ask the question and and we always look for the randomness. and, And I know that my mentor a few years back, probably 2013 is when I started working with him, and one of the things he said was, hey, man, why don't you th- why do you think you don't have great ideas or better yet? How can you have better ideas? And I'm like, well, I don't know. At the time, I honestly thought they, you know, just struck you like a lightning bolt or something. And he said, we well, got to feed your mind, you know, the, the raw materials for ideas to create. So you have to get it from, you know, this place, marketing, this place place, the real estate book, this place, uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal article, this place, the online right. blog about Sonia. Right. And he said, and it's like, it's like you can't have a cake without eggs in the bowl and flour and sugar. That's and I'm true. sure someone can cook it with, but you got to have the ingredients there and then they mix up and that's how the good ideas kind of come to it. So it sounds like that's along the same lines of, of what you would do too. And, and that's pretty cool. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, doing coaching is a really good thing, um, you know, for people to just learn uh, in in a different fashion. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, if you're joining a mastermind or something, it does not have to be just in real estate. Um, I'm in law right now, but I go to things and I learn from people that are in all different sorts of industries. And it helps me with all of the different um, businesses that I counsel. One of the books that, uh, you know, 
your people might look at is called double double. How to double your revenue and profit in three years or less. Now it sounds uh, very tantalizing, but there's a lot of good information in there. That's uh, you know done by my friend Cameron Harold. Uh, he used to be a COO of One um, Eight Hundred Got Junk, and um, he has a, a section in there particularly for um, you know how you grow in a tr- times of a recession. I think it's chapter 11 hmm. or something like that. And, you know, all of the things you can do to, uh, you know, really move forward, move the ball forward, even though everyone else is down in the math and uh, feels like they're going to go bankrupt. Um, so I look for things like that because I know they're going to be down t- times and uh, I want to be prepared for them. I have I believe uh, is part of my mission is to keep my clients uh, in growth mode and to keep uh, being their quarterback and encouraging them uh, that they can, um, you know, live their dream and become what they wanted to become um, as long as they know what that is and they take the time to do it. (laughs) Um, But it's important that they uh, move forward um, to me as well as to them. So I look for, you know, sections, uh, even a chapter, and I'll just uh, make a copy of that chapter and I'll just email it to clients. Say, take a read of this. This is an interesting uh, way to look at this. Um, Yeah, it's important. That's what a quarterback should do. It's important, too, the way you describe the the timing and the person making the book recommendation, knowing where the person receiving the recommendation is at. So we ask a lot of the randomness, and you're looking for randomness, but – when you're working with coach, mentor, quarterback, the right attorney, uh, the right business partner who knows your personal situation, where you're at, your base of knowledge, and the challenges you happen to be dealing with at a certain point, the right book, the right article, the right piece of wisdom, the right lesson at that that point in time is much more impactful than had that come, you know, a six years earlier when it would have made no sense. So it's it's the timing and the knowing of the person giving and receiving the recommendation is also just as powerful as maybe the book or article would be itself. So, Denise, uh, if you could go back and share the crown jewel of wisdom with yourself, let's just say, if, I don't know, a few years, five years before you got into the real estate development, what would that look like knowing what, what you know now? Um, I think I would have uh, probably started uh, coaching uh, or being coached by uh, other people that were uh, at a different point in their career than me. Uh, So I would have done that sooner. And um, I would have, uh, you know, I would have made a list, a master list at the time of the things that I learned. And then looking forward, how would I apply those uh, to the people that I'm counseling? to make their, uh, you know, businesses thrive. Um, always doing a, a vision. Um, I've done a vision statement uh, for my own business um, and spent a whole day just uh, doing that. I wrote it down and I had uh, put it through a, a marketing graphics company because that's something that I hand out to uh, my suppliers, my vendors, my clients, um, and team members so everybody knows This is where we're going. Um, You know, so that is something that I didn't know back then. Um, But um, where I'm at now, I'm just so uh, enthralled to be able to share that with other people that are at different points in their career. All right. If anyone is listening, Denise, who wants to get some more information about you, do you want to send people to a website or share some contact information? Um, sure. Um, I'm in the Chicago market. I have several offices in the Chicago market. And so my main office, I would say call me if you want to, some further information, 630-756-1160. Or you can go to my website, www.girachlawfirm.com, spelled G-I-E-R-A-C-H, lawfirm.com. All right. I got pages and notes here myself. I really appreciate you sharing these good ideas. I, I had a bunch of light bulbs. I'm sure the audience did too, but I really appreciate you, Denise, shutting the door from distractions and sharing your time so generous, generously with us here today on the REI Diamond Show. Appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for tuning in to the REI Diamond Show. 
Are you interested in the early notification of future episodes? You can subscribe on YouTube or podcasting apps as, such as uh, iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Podcasts, among others. Uh, just search REI Diamonds and click subscribe. You can also sign up to receive the weekly new episode notification email at reidiamonds.com. My main business is buying and selling houses, as you probably heard me mention on the show, 223 houses bought and sold in 2019. And to date, 62 bought and sold so far in 2020. We currently have another 102 houses in our inventory, either under construction, for sale, or sold and awaiting closing. So here's three ways you and I could do business. If you buy houses in Atlanta, Chicago, or the Philadelphia regions, go to dealswithroi.com. And sign up for the correct buyers list there. There are five lists in total, separated by region. Again, the site is dealswithroi.com. And a second way we could do business, if you are an accredited investor and you'd like to fund a deal or many deals passively, go to fundrehabdeals.com and sign up to receive private mortgage investment opportunity emails. And the third way we could potentially do business is if you have a deal for sale in either Atlanta, Chicago, or the Philadelphia region, please send me an email or send me the details using the form at reidiamonds.com. At that site, reidiamonds.com, you can also explore the 150-plus content-rich money-making, rich-getting, idea-packed episodes we've published over the years. Many of those ideas have made my team and I some serious dough, and I hope they do the same for you. Oh, and by the way, are you tired of paying too much tax? You will definitely want to tune in to the upcoming episode uh, where we discuss cost segregation with cost segregation specialists, Yona Weiss joining us here on the show to discuss taking huge depreciation write-offs on investment property. And it's especially even more impactful for those of us real estate professionals as defined by the IRS tax code. I'll catch you soon. Until then, keep closing deals, my friend. Thank you for listening to this episode of the REI Diamonds Show with Dan Breslin. To receive email notifications of new weekly episodes, sign up at www.reidiamonds.com.